In the interest of time and allowing all of the speakers a, a fair crack of the whip, I think we'll hold any questions to the end and then everybody can make a decision whether to go for a break or ask questions. That's your choice. While Aegon is swapping over, the next presenter we have is Michael Dahl from the University of Manchester in the UK. One announcement, the event this evening will be begin starting at 8 p.m. Please try and make it on time. It is not only food, so there is some other entertainment arranged. If you are late, you will probably miss some of the best bits. So try and be there at 8 o'clock, please. Michael. Thank you, Steve, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is um, a report that we... Uh, produced about the end of last year that was, um, as the title says, a roadmap for the future of multi-site video conferencing. And as the title also says, this was a roadmap uh, for the future within the UK e-science program. So what we're not proposing is that this, uh, this covers um, video conferencing for everyone's needs, but we were very much focused on the needs of the um, e-science community. Um, as we all know, the grid is about distributed resources and, about, and it's about access to those distributed resources. But it's also about collaboration. Um, and in fact, building the grid itself is a very collaborative effort. And frankly, this would be impossible um, if we all had to trot off to meetings across the other side of the country or even across the world. We'd, we'd just be jet lagged permanently and uh, we wouldn't get any work done. So video conferencing does have a future. In fact, it is becoming um, a necessity in many of our lives. But what's, what this report was aiming to do was to, to look at two things, really. What technologies are out there? Um, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses in various aspects? And, and secondly, how might we improve video conferencing for the science community? Um, and that's what we try to address in this report. Okay, um, my role in all of this was um, I was the um, editor of this report and I managed the process. And uh, I have to say right at the outset that I probably have an access grid bias. That's where I was coming from. Um, but I was <laughs> fairly tempered by, in my access grid bias by all these other people who um, hopefully show a good range of expertise across the board in all of the technologies that we looked at. Um, and there were some, some quite influential names, uh, Felipe, Felipe uh, Galvez, uh, VRVS expert, Ivan Judson, and Jim Miller, Access Grid, so, and, and various other systems were there as well. But I have to also say that these, um, these slides are entirely my own work, they're my interpretation of the report, so um, none of the blame for any mistakes I make is theirs. Okay, this is what I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, firstly, give a bit more of um, a context for the report, the, uh, tell you a little bit about what the UK eScience core program is all about um, and why there's so much need for video conferencing. Secondly, I'll go through what the, uh, the contents of the report are, what we, what we actually had a look at, and then uh, dig a little bit deeper into the, into the technologies that we looked at, which were Access Grid, H323, H320, uh, VRVS, and then non-studio based video conferencing which was a kind of an attempt to lap up everything else. Uh, we also looked at interoperability which is, uh, which is a key, key subject um, and then I'll briefly go through about some of the recommendations because this was a roadmap for the future so the, uh, a key thing about the report was that it had recommendations for further funding. So the, e -science, the UK eScience core program. Um, this is really the, uh, the UK's effort to be at the forefront of grid research. And um, from, their, from the website, it says, the grid will provide easy access to computing power, data processing, and the communication of results. And uh, the first thing that the eScience core program did was to set up eight, eight regional centers and a national center, the national center based in Edinburgh. And these were spread across 12 sites across the UK, right from the north to the south. Um, and there are many UK projects that spawned from this e-science program with, with international and international collaborations. So 
there is a clear need for collaboration technology. And in fact, it, it, as I say, it's an absolute necessity. Um, the, amount of, the amount of use that the collaboration technology um, has is just immense, and it just wouldn't have been possible without it. Um, and as part of the initial funding, centres had were given money to set up their own access grid nodes. This was the first technology, although I have to say that this, this preceded um, the report funding findings. So this is what the report covers. This is, this is basically a list of section headings uh, on the chapters. Where each technology fits best. All of these different technologies have their own niches. They're all um, designed to, to fulfill certain needs and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. So we're, we examined where they, where they were best used. They all have different um, cost implications. Um, we looked at ease of use. We looked at the quality of the display, the visual and the audio quality. Uh, we looked at networking issues, multi-site issues, um, collaborative tools, um, or rather, in more cases, the lack of collaborative tools, um, security, um, how people's privacy was protected, the future potential of these tools, and very importantly, interoperability between the tools. And finally, the recommendations for the UK science program. What I've done is I've put stars next to the ones that I'm going to talk about. There's, um, it's impossible to cover the whole of this report was about 80 pages long. And what I omitted from my slides, and, and would have been a very good idea, is to have a URL to this report because it is available on the web. You can all download it, have a look at it, and, in, and go into further depth about some of the things that I'm not going to talk about, or indeed some of the things I am. Um, but anyway, it's, it's in the extended abstract. There is a URL in the extended abstract, so uh, have a look at that on the, on the program if you're interested. Okay, so the first of the technologies we looked at uh, was Access Grid. Um, here's where my bias as an editor came in, I guess, um, and uh, my Access Grid background. This is uh, Access Grid, for those of you who don't know, was a research tool. That's how it was originally invented um, by Argonne National Laboratory in the US. And over here, we sort of see a very sort of typical view of an Access Grid session. This is in the uh, node in in Manchester at my institution and what you can see there is the, a view of the display wall and um, I think in this meeting there were was taking, it was 12 sites and about 25 people taking part in what was essentially a, a management meeting. This, was a, this is a kind of management uh, committee of the science program, the engineering task force and what's interesting about this is that um, first of all we decided to have the one meeting over Access Grid to see how it went and then we decided to have every other meeting over Access Grid and every other meeting face to face but the first meeting was so successful and people were so pleased that they didn't have to travel halfway across the country to talk to each other that we never had another meeting face to face so uh, that, that kind of shows the success of this kind of technology and it, and it shows how, how much it's given to the program already. This over here is a, is a sort of another thing that um, Access Grid started out always like this, but they, they're sort of more aiming to kind of smaller uh, in-the-office nodes, and that's kind of what they look like. So Access Grid, brief description of the technology. Um, it's about commodity equipment. You can buy all the equipment that you need to make an Access Grid in uh, very easily available. It's also about open source software. You can download the software for free across the internet and these days you can even take part in the development process. Yeah, it's usually about a, a large scale display. Now you need a large scale display because typical access grid meetings have a lot of sites. So you need a lot of pixel space to show all those sites. But you might also need a large scale display to have um, a large image of the speaker because uh, you want to, to have a look at the non-verbal cues, the body language to see whether people are smiling, laughing, crying, whatever. Um, High quality full duplex audio, which is, which is an absolute necessity, I think, in any, uh, any video conference, without, without which you don't get any effective collaboration. Access Grid uses multicast networking, usually. Um, and this is kind of a look into the sort of future of Access Grid. Um, Access Grid people don't like being lumped into video conference, the video conference term. They don't like the term video conference. Advanced collaboration environment is what they're aiming for, um, although it's probably true to say that at the moment it is, it is just video conferencing. Um, but that is what they're aiming for. 
Um, so Axis Grid 2, which is actually being sort of released as I speak around about this time, is, has these kind of things. Uh, the first is more integration with grid technologies, which is kind of what you'd expect from the name. It's Access Grid. Um, the grid technologies are used for security, um, for the kind of privacy aspects, and also in the data management, which goes, goes along with, which is why they're calling it a collaboration environment, because of the data sharing and so on. Access Grid 2 will also provide a framework for integrated services. It's envisaged that um, anyone can write these services. Anyone can attach um, services similar to web services to Access Grid sessions and kind of enrich the technology. Improved network features. Well, I mentioned that Access Grid used multicast. Well, although multicast is, is not that newer network technology, it's still pretty new in deployment terms. And it's all very well when a new site gets an access grid node and they say, okay, where's this multicast? It, it takes a lot of work sometimes to get the multicast going. Um, we often need multicast unicast bridges to support access grid. So that's, a, that's an important feature and a better audio visual quality. Okay, next technology we looked at, H323, H320. Um, termed it mainstream video conferencing because you go into any business um, and say video conferencing, and this is probably what they'll think of. These are the two, two big vendors, Tanberg in Europe, Polycom in the US, and two pictures I just downloaded from their uh, respective websites. And it's typically what most business people think of when, when you say the term video conferencing. Um, how do they connect? H323 goes over IP. H320 uses uh, dedicated ISDN lines. Um, they usually employ hardware codecs, uh, at least at the scale that we're talking about. And for the first three main technologies, we were really looking at studio-based video conferencing um, as differentiated from non-studio-based. Uh, you plug microphones, cameras into the hardware codecs. And one of the big strengths of this, kind of, this type of video conferencing is they have what they call broadcast quality video. It's, it's as good as you can see on the TV. But this kind of, I guess, has a kind of downside is that... Uh, it typically only has a single video stream from each site, and which makes multi-site conferences hard. And in fact, if you want to take part in a multi-site uh, video conferencing using this technology, then you better not have more than four sites, really. I, I know it's technically possible to go up to nine, I think, with some codecs, um, but you get very, very small images, and it's, and it's very difficult to, to make that a meaningful thing. So multi-site conferences is probably not what it does well at the moment. Older systems of this kind use voice-selected video. That is, your, your video comes up if you speak the loudest or you cough the loudest, and, and that, again, is uh, extremely difficult for effective collaboration. But I have to stress that's very much older systems. You, you, um, modern H323, H320 systems um, have full duplex. This is a very pat comment at the, at the bottom. H323 insecure, H320 highly secure. I was talking to Steve about this last night. Um, there's all sorts of issues connected with this, whether you really want your meeting to be secure, whether anyone's going to be that bothered to, to snoop packets and to try and interpret them, and whether they'd even be able to, um, even though it's, it's allegedly insecure. But it does have, um, you know, it, it is a meaningful concept, especially when you get into the stage where doctors are talking about people's uh, medical records, and it's a, there's a great need to be confidential. Um, they need to have absolute assurance that it's confidential, and they might often switch to H320, even if they were using H323 before. Okay, VRVS, um, another research project, um, often in competition for funds with Access Grid, I believe, in the US. Um, started by Caltech, there's a, a picture of the web portal. Um, Egon had some, had some better pictures, of, uh, which gave you a better idea of what VRVS looked like. VRVS essentially is two main things. It's the central web server, which I've just shown you, um, but it's also a worldwide reflector network. If you want to take part in a VRVS conference, then once you've downloaded the software and so on, you'll connect to um, a reflector, which is near you. If you haven't got a reflector near you, um, then what VRVS will do is, is support you to set one up, and they'll, uh, they'll support the reflector themselves, um, and that, that's how it works, and that's how the, the reflector network has spread. Um, a major strength of VRVS is the uh, usability with a wide variety of software and hardware clients, which can be H323 or Mbone. And um, 
Because of this, it's used by a wide range of facilities, right down from the laptop right to studio facilities. Um, again, we, we, we uh, encountered some prejudices, uh, my own included, when we first started doing this report and thought that everyone using VRVS did it off their laptop or did it off their desktop, but uh, we were assured that there are studio-based facilities that, that support VRVS. Um, like the Access Grid, it's used for large multi-site conferences, and that's probably what it's good at. Future developments, um, there was a whole long list in the report, but um, these are what I thought were probably the main ones. User authentication, again using um, grid technologies. More virtual rooms. Um, a selection of bandwidth ranges so that uh, you can do it from your modem at home um, or from a studio. Centralized control, that means centralized control of of meetings, so you might want to determine where people's presentation appears on the screen, where the video streams appear. That's what that's meant by that. Improved video, um, improved network features. Okay, this is the last category, and this was an attempt to just include everything else. Non-studio-based video conferencing. Low-cost, do-it-yourself solution. Um, typically, you'd have some kind of video cam maybe sitting on top of your laptop. Maybe you have something more sophisticated than that. Uh, maybe you'd have a microphone uh, headset. Uh, but what you could also do, and what this solution also encompassed, was, was things a little bit better than that. Um, things which, uh, like I showed in an earlier slide, that the Axis Grid is attempting to do. Something which might sit in the corner of your office and is usable by three or four people at once. And for that, you need something like this, which is a, a low-cost echo cancellation device that also has ha got an inbuilt microphone and a speaker. Uh, and with that, you can have three or four people taking part in the same meeting, and that's um, quite a cheap solution, although, of course, quality degrades as you, as you get cheaper, as you'd expect. So, features of non-studio-based video conferencing typically uses commodity H323 software, desktop computer, video cam, been through that. Um, the quality of the experience is limited, although it can be approved using cheap echo cancellation. Again, it just depends on how much you're willing to spend on it. Um, security is limited or non-existent. That kind of goes back to the, the, the PAT statement I made about H323. Because you're using H323, you have limited um, guarantee of security. And it's probably best suited to one-to-one -one meetings where seeing co-participants is useful or to conduct limited data sharing. But this is an important point down here. What this is, is probably most useful is to supplement studio-based facilities. You might have an access grid node in your... Uh, in your university or on your campus, but you want to have a meeting with uh, Japan and you're based in the UK, well, you don't want to have to get up at, at 2 o'clock in the morning and go into university. Maybe you just want to do it from your bedroom or your study or something like that. So, so you might have this kind of facility at, at home. All right, the next uh, big chapter in the, in the report was all about interoperability. Uh, it was also a very difficult one to write. Um, what if collaborators have different technologies? Um, many of the projects in the e-science program are joint industrial academic projects. So a lot of industry has already got H323, H320 technology. We're coming along and we've got access grid nodes. How do we talk to each other? You might also need to support people who are on the road. Maybe you're, you're at a conference. You need to take part in a meeting back at site. You know, you need, you need support for that. Um, but also quite important, um, fallback solutions. You need interoperability with other, maybe other technologies in case the first technology doesn't work. So here's a table <laughs> um, that doesn't appear in the report, um, but maybe it should have done. Is a, is a kind of my summary of, of this chapter in the report on interoperability and a uh, fairly sort of trivial diagram there. They all interoperate with each other. Uh, if they didn't, there'd be something very wrong. Um, but also included on this is the telephone. And this is, this is important, as I say, as part of a fallback solution. Uh, for example, if you're having a, an access grid meeting or some kind of meeting and the audio goes out because the multicast network has gone down and it happens, then you need to be able to continue this meeting. Um, and it's very useful to be able to, to pick up a phone, to get a speaker phone in there, and to be able to continue the audio dialogue um, by the telephone network. Of course, the, the audio quality goes down, but, you, but it's important to be able to carry on. So um, I'll, uh, I won't go into detail about all these, uh, all these things. 
Other issues to do with interoperability is this lowest common denominator user experience. In order to be able to interoperate, uh, perhaps you need to lower the standards of each of the technologies so you can have something that they both work with. Um, and this means that the, the quality of the experience for all the participants is lower than they might get if they were just using one technology. So if everyone you know, usually uses an access grid, they might have one level of technology. If you have to go lower to interoperate with another system, everyone sort of loses out. So um, that, that's a problem. It's usually technically challenging uh, for most of these things. It's not, not straightforward to do. Um, sometimes it's not even possible, but even when it is possible, it's not straightforward. Um, and this was a very uh, important area as well. Um, booking video conferences anyway is a very difficult thing. Um, you know, you not only have to, it's, it's difficult enough booking a meeting between a, you know, 10 or 15 people because you have to find a clear date. But if you also have to find a clear date between all of their institutions' video conference facilities, it's incredibly difficult. If you then have to make those bookings in different booking systems, within different technologies, say an access grid technology and a VRVS technology, the problem just gets really, really hard, but, um, but still has to be tackled somehow. So um, this is, this is uh, potentially, we think, is going to be a major problem in the future. So last couple of slides. These, we came up with nine recommendations, nine recommendations to take this forward, um, nine recommendations that we wanted funding. Um, and this is the recommendations that we took to the science program and said, this is what we need, this is what we see as most urgent to be sorted out. This is what you need to put your money in. Um, and in no particular order, um, create an e-science advanced collaborative environments research and development effort. As soon as you talk to anyone who uses, uh, as soon as you talk to anyone who uses video conferencing of any kind, they say, oh yeah, wouldn't it be good if it did this or it did that? And uh, what would be great to say was, right, okay, well, we'll sort that out. We'll, we'll go away and uh, code that up or something like that. Um, that's kind of what that's aiming at. There are, there are big ways that the, this kind of technologies can be improved. Um, the second recommendation was to um, formalize access grid support. In the UK, we have quite a good uh, support for H323, H320 um, systems. Um, Caltech offers support for VRVS. What's missing is any kind of coherent formal access grid support. So we wanted a, an access grid support center, uh, which would also handle deployment advice. These last two issues were dealing with the, the difficulties in interoperability. It turns out that, uh, I mean, access grid and VRVS use the same software, the same audio and media tools, Vic and RAT, or they can do at least. Um, even so, it's not it's not always the case that they can fully interoperate between each other, although it, it, it should be fairly trivial. But anyway, we, uh, we put our recommendations about that. Enable maximum interoperability between Access Grid and H323, H320. Notice we used the word maximum because we thought that we might not ever get there. Um, I talked about the problems with uh, sometimes have multicast. What we need is uh, what we decided we needed was formal multicast, unicast bridges to support new access grid sites. Um, and this, this recommendation here, improve local networking in support of IP-based video conferencing. We, we found out that uh, this is how I got in contact with Steve, really, because Steve emailed me and, and said that he was already doing a report about this and was already taking this forward, so that's, that's very good and, and it saved anyone else any work. Um, and lastly, investigate improvements for multi-site booking systems. And we're already starting to take that forward uh, by raising it with uh, the Global Grid Forum to see how they, how they might support standards for resource sharing. The grid is all about resource sharing. Um, video conferencing resources are, are, are similar to any other kind of computing resource. And that's how you can get in contact with me. Um, you can see a picture of me at that website if you haven't seen enough of me already. And that's my uh, email address. And that's who I work for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. As I said, we'll do some quick questions.